Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Glad everybody's here and uh, everybody survived the storm. Amen. Not too much damage anyway. And uh, we're glad you're here. I'm going to open up tonight uh, a little bit different. We got a lot of sickness going on, so we ain't going to have no music tonight because all of my musicians is, uh, is uh, sick. So I guess it's a pretty good reason. But uh, just by way of announcements tonight, uh, this coming Sunday, 3.30, will be kids' uh, choir practice. 
Uh, that's, our, oh, that's on the calendar anyway. If anything changes, we'll tell you. Uh, the 21st, the 21st, right after our 5 o'clock service, we'll be having our annual business meeting. Uh, that is the 21st, uh, not this coming Sunday, but the next. Uh, also, it was mentioned this past Sunday, we're beginning the RISE sponsorship for this upcoming year. We're a little late starting it, so we only got about six months worth of sponsorship. And uh, what we're asking you is to sponsor uh, the, our teams uh, going to RISE and Pigeon Forge in July, $50 a month. Uh, that'd be 300 bucks uh, that we'll be collecting this year. Uh, so if you'd like to be a part of that, we got the sign-up sheet. I'll have it laying down here uh, after service. And our goal is to get 20 people to do that. And then you just give uh, $50 a month that it goes straight to the GL teams uh, to help take them to a rise in July. Also, this coming Sunday morning, many of you are going on the Singing uh, at Sea uh, cruise. Uh, that's just a few weeks out. Uh, after Sunday morning service, we will be having a meeting with everybody going on that cruise right after service uh, to give you some uh, information. Pastor Tyler will. So make sure you're here for that. And then this coming Sunday night, it's very important you be here. We are going to be finishing up our three-part series on what a deacon is, uh, what to look for in a deacon, and then uh, we'll be passing out. And then Sunday night, you will be doing your nomination, uh, who you think the deacon ought to be uh, coming up for the year of 2024. So we'll be doing that this coming Sunday night. We'll preach on it. We have already done the deacon in, uh, in his faith, the deacon in his faithfulness. And then this coming Sunday night will be the deacon and his family. And then before we leave, we'll give out those sheets. And uh, by then, it's been about three weeks. Uh, you ought to pretty much know uh, who you're going to nominate for that position. And then uh, we'll collect all those before you leave Sunday night. And then we'll move forward with that. Amen. Uh, let's take up some prayer requests tonight. I got a list here already. Uh, I'm going to mention all of them. Then I'll take yours up. And then we'll pray. We continue to remember Miss uh, Donna Nick. Uh, who's still at home recovering from her surgery. Uh, remember Brother Lynn, who was in the hospital on Sunday, but uh, he came home yesterday, so let's remember him. Uh, remember Trevor and his family. Uh, the flu has hit their house. Uh, it's a strep throat, so let's remember them. They're home tonight. Uh, remember James and Mama. Uh, James is sick, and uh, Mama's just crossing her fingers that she don't come down with it, uh, so let's remember them. Uh, let's see, Tyler, uh, he's homesick tonight. Uh, that stomach bug's got him. Uh, Laura's back in the bed sick again uh, with the same stuff, so uh, I don't know what the deal is. Uh, I think the, the, about the moment that uh, I finalized with the Lord in our conversation that we was going to dwell on unity, uh, stuff has blowed off the roof. Amen. I don't know if we've all been in church and my family together, but maybe once or twice since before Christmas. Uh, but you remember Laura, she's home tonight. Uh, remember Miss Trina, she's still recovering from her surgery. Uh, remember Miss Kristen, she's still homesick. She uh, was diagnosed with the flu. Found out today she's got strep on top of the flu. And uh, so you remember her. And uh, also remember Miss Jane Shelley and her health. Uh, continue to remember uh, Adam is home tonight with a migraine. His mom is sick, so let's remember uh, them. Uh, let's see, Miss Rhonda, let's continue to remember her. She got some good reports this week. Would you like to share that? Go ahead. Nothing but scar tissue. Amen. So uh, that's good news. That's a praise report. Amen. It's uh, good to see Brother Richard and him. I was told y'all was sick this weekend or you were sick this weekend, right? Did you have that flu stuff too? Well, it's good to see you here tonight. Amen. Uh, let's see. I think that's all that's on my list so far. Has anybody else got an outspoken? Somebody else? Miss Pete? Um, Adam and Ari have the flu. Um, Peyton and McKenna uh, have strep and ear infections. 
is the most wonderful thing. You said pay it in the end. Peyton McKenna, ear infection and strep, you said? Somebody else? Is good news. Praise the Lord. Somebody else. John, a uh, pastor friend of mine back home, Kim Henry, his wife has breast cancer. Jennifer Henry. Somebody else. Remember Josh Maverick? Yes, ma'am. Remember Kayla, my granddaughter, when she's got the infusion, when she's got it made? And I just pray that she makes her way home. Just remember that. Somebody else or not? Somebody else tonight before we pray. Yes, sir. My daughter, Sheila, has had migraines for the past several years and hurting in her face and jaw on her left side. They've done everything. She's had surgery. And this past week, they went to Florida to the Mayo Clinic, and they did some kind of balloon to inside her mouth to try to move the nerves off of the arteries or something. We're just praying that that answer to her prayer. Somebody else. Continue to remember uh, Laura's dad. Uh, he's still going in the right direction, numbers, and everything still looks good. He's actually up uh, doing his PT every day, so hopefully real soon he'll be leaving the hospital going to rehab. And uh, so that's good news. So, But we do ask you to continue to remember him in prayer. Somebody else before we pray tonight. Yes, ma'am. Found in my mom's throat, it's just precancerous, but she goes tomorrow to schedule a surgery to try to get it taken out. So it'll be her second throat surgery. <coughs> she goes tomorrow to see? For them to schedule it. Schedule it. Anybody else? Praise report, prayer request, either or. All right. Let's uh let's join around the altar tonight, if you can. And let's take these knees to the Lord and we'll spend a few minutes praying. And then we'll come back and jump into Galatians chapter number five. I admonish you to lift your voices up towards heaven. Father God in heaven, we come to you this afternoon. God, Lord, thank you, first of all, that we can be in your house. 
God, we're grateful and thankful, Lord, that as uh, far as the storm that came through here yesterday, there was minimal damage done to our buildings, God. And, Lord, you know the needs behind us, Lord, with that situation. So I pray <clears throat> that your will be done there. But I am grateful and thankful, Lord, that we can be back here tonight, God. And we want to lift these names up to you. I pray, Lord, for Miss Donna, whose home is still recovering, Lord, from this uh, back surgery she had. Lord, she's having good days and bad days. And I pray, God, you would touch her and heal her. Help her, Lord, with her PT. God, Lord, she'll be back on her feet walking and maneuvering. God, Lord, the way that she needs to be real quickly, God. Well, I'm thankful, Lord, to get the report of uh, Brother Lynn getting home from the hospital, Lord, and uh, got to follow up with some tests. I pray, God, you'd touch him, you'd help him. God, you know what he stands in need of as far as his physical needs, Lord. God, I lift up Brother Fred and Miss Phyllis who ain't here tonight, God, Lord, and I pray, God, Lord, for their health that you would touch them. I pray, God, Lord, for Brother Trevor and his household, Lord, the flu has struck them and other uh, things, God, viruses, strep. God, sinus infections, all of the above, Lord. I pray, God, you touch uh, the children, touch Trevor. I pray, God, if Shay ain't have it yet, God, Lord, you would be with her. I pray, Lord, for Trevor's mom, Tammy. Lord, you touch her and help her with her sickness. I pray, Lord, for James tonight, God, is homesick <clears throat> with that stomach virus. I pray that you'd help him. Lord, I pray that you protect mama from it, God, and I pray, God, that would ease up off of him real soon. As you, God, to touch Tyler tonight at home, who's battling the same thing along with Laura. Lord, I pray, God, you touch both of them. Lord, help them. I know they both would love to be here tonight. God, so I pray, God, you would minister their spirits tonight. I pray, Lord, for Miss Trina, Lord, who's home recovered from her surgery. We're thankful, Lord, for the success of that surgery. And I ask you, God, Lord, to heal her. Lord, that she can be back on her feet real soon. God, Lord, Miss Jane and her health problems, Lord, you know what she's facing. God, I pray, God, Lord, you give her uh, wisdom. I pray, God, you give the doctors wisdom, Lord, and give her answers. God, I pray, Lord, for Miss Kristen, who's home tonight, God, Lord, with the flu and strep. I pray, God, you would touch her, heal her, Lord. I know, God, she'd love to be here tonight, God, Lord, doing what she does every Wednesday night. So I pray, God, you would touch her in her body, God, be with Brother Brian. Lord, ever protect him from this stuff. I pray, Lord, for Adam, home tonight with a migraine, touch his head, touch his mom and her sickness. I'm thankful, Lord, for the good report Miss Rhonda gave us tonight, God, Lord, that uh, there was nothing to biopsy, Lord scar tissue and I praise your name for what you've done in our heart and our life and I pray that you continue uh, to watch over. I pray Lord for this uh, uh, this young man Mr. Bowers Lord who's battling his health Lord uh, old in age but ready to cross over Lord I pray God you be with him and help him I pray Lord for Adam and Ariella Lord home with the flu touch their bodies God I pray Lord for Peyton and McKenna Lord, who has ear infections and strep, Lord, I pray, God, for them. I'm thankful, Lord, uh, for the report, Lord, that we hear the work that you're doing in Scotty's heart, Lord, that prayers that you're answering, Lord, but uh, they have sickness and his wife had COVID. I pray that you touch them in the physical sense, but also, God, in the spiritual realm. Lord, I pray, God, for Jennifer Henry down there in Alabama, Lord, as she battles breast cancer, you'd be with her and help her and help uh, Pastor Tim, God, as he endeavors to take care of the church, take care of his family, and also be there for his wife, God, Lord, give him strength. Lord, I pray, Lord, for Kayla, God, the decisions that's got to be in her life that she's got to make, Lord. I pray, God, Lord, for those decisions. I pray, Lord, for spirituality, that you'll, uh, you'll do a work there, Lord. I pray, God, for this young lady named Sheila who has these problems with migraines. God, Lord, you would touch her and help her in the procedure that was done. Lord, may it be successful for uh, to ease up these pains of these headaches. God, I pray, Lord, for Mark tonight, God, who's still there in the hospital trying to recover from this surgery. God, continue to give him strength in his legs, strength in his back, God, Lord, and give him, uh, God, give him the ambition and the zeal, God, to keep pushing forward. I pray, Lord, for our dear sister's mom who's going to go to the doctor tomorrow to find out when she can have a procedure uh, to take these things out of her throat. I pray, God, Lord, that that would be very uh, swiftly and successful, God, that your will will be done. God, I pray, Lord, for the ministries of the church. You know our need in the preschool. God, we need some substitutes. We need teachers, God. And I pray, God, Lord, that you supply that need. We've been asking you for a while now, God. Lord, it sure would take a great burden from us, Lord, if you supply that need. But I am grateful and thankful for those that stand in the gap and those that are faithful to those kids, Lord, each and every day. And I pray, God, you bless their efforts. God, I pray, Lord, for our teen ministry. I pray, God, Lord, for the Wanna crowd tonight, God, the children's ministry. Everything, God, Lord, that we do around here for the cause of Christ. I'm thankful, Lord, for those who's made their way to the house of God tonight to endeavor to learn more from the scriptures. So I pray, God, Lord, as we enter into uh, this book of Galatians, chapter number five, and we cover a few verses tonight, God, Lord, you would uh, illuminate our minds, help us, Lord, to recall those things that we've studied. And God, may we feed the flock of pe the people of God, and we'll bless your name for it. And all these things we ask in your name, that name is above every name. My bloodstained redeemer, I pray, and the church says, Amen, amen. Thank you for praying, and you can return to your seat. And we'll receive our offering tonight at the side door. Uh, Brother Ryan, he'll be at the side door tonight. And remember, everything that comes in 
on Wednesday nights, go straight to our, uh, the camp meeting that we're going to be having, uh, not camp meeting, Jubilee, I don't know why I say camp meeting, Jubilee, uh, coming on uh, starting the last Sunday of September, and uh, we're looking forward to that, and uh, hopefully we'll have some printed materials uh, here real soon that we can give you to pass out to invite your family and your friends, amen, 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 I'm glad you're here tonight. I mean, this is a place, you know, through all that goes on, you can kind of come in, just take a deep breath and just whew, let it out. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for the church. I'm thankful for the time we can spend in the Word of God. Take your Bibles tonight. Let's go to Galatians chapter number 5. We're just going to cover a few verses tonight. So it's possible you might get out of here before 730, 740. Amen. Amen. Y'all might be standing in line waiting on your children to get out. Won't that be a change? <laughs> Amen. Galatians chapter Number five, this is about the third part of chapter number five, and we're going to break it down and uh, cover about two or three verses about the works of the flesh, and then uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll come in and we'll cover the fruits of the Spirit and wrap up the, uh, wrap up the chapter. Uh, we probably could have done both of them together, but I just didn't want to mix the flesh works uh, with the spiritual uh, works, the fruit of the Spirit. So that's kind of why we broke it down. But in Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 19, and the Bible says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Which means these things we're about to list and the things that we're about to go and dissect and uh, kind of give you some definitions of what these words mean. Uh, it is uh, uh, biblically impossible for them to be a work of the Spirit. Okay. Look at your Bible real close. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, verse number 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like. Of thee which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul is saying, in other words, this ain't the first time we've talked about this. This ain't the first time we've taught on this. You know, there's some things in life that you, uh, uh, we already know that you got to tell somebody something at least six times before it really registers. Right? Y'all ever heard that? Listen, lust gets... But love gives. Lust gets. Lust is always wanting. Love gives. Then the secret of the victorious life lies not in eradication or suppression of the old nature. You can't just suppress the old nature. Paul teaches us that the old nature has to be put on the cross. And any time that you find yourself indulging or these things that Paul mentions in these few verses here uh, uh, coming alive in your life is only showing you that the old man has gotten off the cross. You know the old song, some of y'all, the old song, uh, uh, The Old Man's Dead? Y'all ever heard that song that's sung in church, The Old Man's Dead? You know, that's a good song to sing, but it ain't much truth in it because the old man ain't dead, right? Any of y'all experienced the old man today? Yeah, I have. Yeah, we'll probably experience it again before we go to bed. You know, that don't make it right. But what I'm just saying is, reality is, if you're saved, there's two of you. There's the old man and the new man. Before you were saved, you was just the old man. You had no problem lusting. You had no problem satisfying the flesh. But then you get saved, and now you're battling that old man. Our biggest problem is not Satan. Our biggest problem, honestly, is not demons. Our biggest problem is this flesh that you're born in. And whenever we can, when we, when, and the only way to get a hold of the flesh is to crucify it. Well, we don't like doing that, right? We like pampering it, right? We, I walked in the door a while ago. I, the first thing I always do is look at them little boxes on the wall. It said 60. Nobody thought about cutting the heat on today. I guess we'll talk to Trevor about that. He's here all day long. He didn't think about you today. I seen y'all, you know, like you're about to freeze to death. So I, come, I bumped it up. Why? Our flesh gets cold, right? And, you know, we could go back and forth, but truth of the matter is, you can't just eradicate the flesh. You can't just suppress the old nature, you know, but, you know, there's got to be a counteraction. 
There's got to be something that's got to be done to take care of that flesh. And Paul tells you, you've got to crucify it. Crucify means to be put to death. To be put to death means it has no options. There is no life. you got to put the, everything about your flesh. has got to be put on that cross. And the Bible even says this, crucify your flesh. How often? Daily. Daily. Which means if it got crucified daily, that tells you it's not dead all the time. That means it can be resurrected if that's the right terminology to use. So if the Christian is walking in the power of the Spirit, he is obviously not controlled by the flesh. You cannot walk in the Spirit and be controlled by the flesh. You follow me? Y'all with me? It's good y'all young people's in here now. You're going to find out why you battle all these things that Paul talks about in here. Listen, hey, if a Christian is walking in the power of the Spirit, he is obviously not controlled by the flesh. At any moment, he is under control of one or the other. Right now, as I'm speaking, you're under control of either your flesh or the Spirit. If you're bored, it's your flesh. If you're not getting nothing, it's your flesh. If you don't want to get nothing, it's your flesh. If you don't care about the Bible, it's your flesh. If you don't care about your brother or your sister, it's your flesh. If you're wrapped up in these things that Paul's talking about, it's all the flesh. So therefore, if we're in the flesh, we cannot be pleasing God. To him to know it, to doeth good, and doeth it not, to him it is what? Sin. Sin. Listen. Because this is true, a checklist right here in the Bible, what Paul is giving, a checklist is now given to the Galatians to help them tell when the Spirit is running them or the flesh is running them. Have you never asked yourself, have you never been in a point in life and you say, man, is that my Spirit? Or is that the Spirit telling me that? Or is that my flesh telling me that? Y'all ever have that problem? Help me out now, I ain't got no showers in here tonight. Land, you better wake up. Y'all, y'all, y'all ever battle that? I mean, you ever, you ever just feel like, man, I want to say something so bad, but, but you know, does the, Lord, does the Lord want me to say this or is that my flesh? Right? So what Paul is doing is saying, hey, guys, I understand and God understands that, that you are a new creature in Christ trapped inside of the old nature flesh man who is still subject to sin. Still covet and still, still subject to lust and to covet and to want. And the only way to, 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 to get that person under control is you got to walk by the Spirit. But you got to crucify the flesh. But one way or the other, you're going to be influenced by one or the other. So Paul says, all right, now here's the deal right here. Some Christians would love just to be, just tell me what to do and not to do because I can check the list off and I know I'm right. See what I'm saying? Because you ain't got to make no decisions. Just, you know, just do A, B, C equals righteousness. We're not making it a whole lot easier? Well, Paul gives us a checklist that, hey, if you want to know if you're abiding in the Spirit, if you're being led of the Spirit, if your life is being, if you're walking in the Spirit, Paul says, here's a checklist. And if you find any of these things in your life, you're not being led by the Spirit. They are the works of the flesh. And you know that their works of the flesh is not pleasing to God. Because the Bible says that your flesh is enmity against God. Your flesh is against God. Look at me. Your flesh don't love God. Right now you start wanting to doze off and go to sleep. It's because your flesh don't like God. Your flesh don't like Bible study. Your flesh don't like reading the Bible. That's why you can, you can scroll all day long and never get sleepy. Pick up that leather book right there. Open it up and start reading. Get through three verses and your eyelids are getting heavy. Because your flesh don't like the things of God. But what do you do? Put that sucker on the cross and you keep on reading. You know what you do? You slap yourself in the face on the pew. Holler amen. Hey, startle everybody in the church where they all wake up and we stay in tune. See, y'all think I, I don't know what y'all struggle with. I ain't always been in the pulpit. I've sat where you sat struggle with the same thing. I've got bored myself while I'm doing the teaching and preaching. The flesh, the flesh. Listen, a checklist Paul is giving right here to find out, man, because I want to know. If you're saved, you should have something inside that wants to know, am I doing right? Am I doing right? Am I living right? Right? Look, look at verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. The works of the flesh is pretty apparent to anybody. 
the first four works of the flesh. Look at them. Look at the first four works of the flesh. Adultery. Do I need to spend a lot of time giving you a definition of what adultery is? No, no, no. He is both sides of it right off Jump Street. If, you, if you're a born-again child of God and you're committing adultery, that ain't no spirit about it. You know, these people, you know, these people go to church with one another, married, and all of a sudden they start committing adultery with a person on the other side of the church. There's a divorce on this side of the church. They yoke up with that one on that side of the church. All of a sudden you see them posting on social media, God has sent me my soulmate. God ain't sent you nothing. God ain't nowhere around it. Adultery still adultery. You know, it ain't popular, but it's Bible. And there's no way an act of the flesh can produce the fruit of the Spirit. Y'all with me? But then look what he says. Here's all you young people. Hey, fornication. Fornication, which is the same thing as adultery. The only difference is adultery is between a man that's married and a woman that's married. And fornication is between those single people out there who ain't married, feel like they got to dibble dabble, play with things they ought not be playing with. Hey, you know, test driving a car before they go and invest in it. You know what I'm saying? Paul says that is a work of the flesh. Then look what he says. Uncleanliness. Lasciviousness. So you see, these first four, man, they're, they're works of the flesh. Many self righteous think because they have works as an evidence of faith that they have saving faith. What do I mean by that? Well, preacher, if I wasn't saved, I wouldn't go to church. If I wasn't saved, I wouldn't read my Bible. If I wasn't saved, I wouldn't give. If I wasn't saved, I wouldn't pray while they're committing adultery, while they're fornicating, while there's uncleanliness in their life. You get what I'm saying? And what they're trying to do is, is they're looking at their works and trying to justify and say, I got saving faith. Listen, the grace of God, let me plug this here, the grace of God will keep you from Sin. It's not for when you fall into sin just to get back out. Y'all get what I'm saying? The grace of God. And a lot of people that walk around, listen, I'm talking about in modern day society, in modern day church, we got more fornicating, uh, 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 fleshly living people that in their mind they're justified because it's the, uh, you know, 2024 now and everybody's doing it. And if everybody's doing it, it must be right, but it still works of the flesh. And Paul says it, it, it's not godly. Listen, listen. Many self-righteous think because they have works as an evidence of faith that they have saving faith. Notice the works of the flesh in verse 19 to the works of, to the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22. Look in your Bible at verse number 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, hey, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That's a vast difference, verse number 19. Big difference. Listen, saving faith, saving faith is connected with fruit and works can be dead. Saving faith is connected to fruit. Works is just connected to a dead man. For by faith through grace are you saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I'm not here to judge who's saved, who ain't saved. I'm just here to tell you the Bible. Anybody that's saved that can keep going on and 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 on, dot, 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 committing the same old fleshly acts without no conviction, without no chastisement, hey, from God in their life, it's almost, I'm just going to step out on them and say this, to me, it's biblically impossible to be born again. I mean, some of y'all ain't committing no great big sins like that, and you feel like you get the dog mess beat out of you whenever you skip your Bible reading one day. Right? It bothers you whenever you, you, you fell asleep, forgot to pray. Oh, my Lord, I didn't pray last night before I went to sleep. Man, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, you know just a simple skip of a prayer, it tears you up. A, skip, a, a simple skip of your Bible reading, it tears you up, right? Right? 
little things. Imagine somebody's doing these works of the flesh. It keeps going on and on and on and on. And there's no kind of, there's no kind of conviction. There's no kind of, there's no kind of chastisement in their life. And all it is is works. What I'm trying to say, if all your life is is the works of the flesh, then it's probably that saving faith that you say you have here. It does not exist. You're banking off, I walk the aisle, a word. You're banking off, you pray, a word. You're banking off, you jumped in a pool, a word. You're banking off something that you've done that oh I must be saved because I did what the preacher said I, I quoted Romans 10 13 and the Bible says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved but a very vital vital ingredient that is missed with that verse is you can never get born again without conviction and when conviction is brought into your heart that brings you to Romans 10 13 and God transforms you on the inside you a new creature in Christ old things are passed away but all things become new you start walking different talking different thinking different living different and all your actions are different and when you do mess up I'm not preaching sinless perfection but when you do mess up when you do fall short when you do trip up when the devil does slide one by when your flesh does fail it tears you up so much you can't help but to fall on your knees right there where you at and say holy God in heaven will you forgive me well I'm sorry I broke your heart y'all understand what I'm saying there's a vast difference but there's a lot of people today that are walking around because they made a profession. But when you look at their lives, all their lives consist of is works of the flesh. And what I'm trying to get to if I go any further is that a saving faith is not connected to works. A saving faith is connected to fruits of the Spirit. A saving faith, I read that. Uh, here's a scripture reference. You can go to Hebrews 9.14. To find out about the uh, saving faith connected with fruits and works or can be dead works. Look at that word lasciviousness in verse 19. What does that word mean? It means is outrageous intemperance of any kind or rages from inordinate affections to sodomy in extreme forms of sexual perversions. So in other words, what Paul begins to deal with is one of the greatest things that humans battle with sex look look don't take my word for it look at verse number 19 the first thing he starts dealing with now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery former clay uncleanness lasciviousness and lasciviousness is none other than being doing a perverted acts and I'm not going to get all off in detail out there on all that because we got a mixed company in here. But truth of the matter is all this sexual perverted garbage that's out there in the world that now man just smiles at. You can see it with a man and a man together. You can see it with the transsexuals, transgenders, bisexuals. I could go on and on and on and on. And all of that is none other than works of the flesh. Sex is only meant for one way. God instituted it. God created it. It's a holy thing between a man and a woman and holy matrimony behind a closed door between that man and woman who's made a vow to God and has come together. God ordains that. God orchestrated that. God created that. God smiles on that. And anything outside of that is none other than a work of the flesh birthed out of the pit of hell. There ain't no excuse. There ain't no way around it. There's no science to back it up. There's no kind of theology. There's nothing else. It is 100% biblically wrong. Amen, amen. Colossians 3, 5, or you go look at Leviticus chapter 20, verse 16. Look what the Bible says here. The next one is idolatry. Idolatry is defined as covetousness. Covetousness. I ain't got to explain what covet is. As always, you know, uh, wanting. Idolizing is something you don't have. You know, like talking to these young people, every one of them here, man, they can't wait to be 21. Right? Why do they want to be 21? That's when I'm legal. Legal to what? Somebody help me. Huh? Drink. That's all 21 does. Make it legal to be able to walk into a store. Can't nobody say nothing to you. Throw your card down. You can buy whatever you want to do. I can't wait to get 21. All they do is tell it on themselves. Right? Amen. Amen. Some of them say, I can't wait to get 18. Why? I'm going to leave home. 
Leave home. Idol that is a work of the flesh defined as coded because you're looking at the 18, you're looking at the 21-old year or you're looking at all these people ahead of you and that's become your idol. You live to be 18. You live to be 21. You live to get to retirement. You know, I'm using simple things. That becomes, uh, that is a work of the flesh. Look at this, witchcraft. Witchcraft. You can tie this in with Revelation chapter 9, verse 21, pharmaceuticals. It includes all drug use used in religious exercise. All drug addictions is connected with seeking the truth. You hear what I'm saying? All drug addiction is linked to seeking the truth. Show me somebody right now that's hooked to Xanax. I'll tell you why they're hooked to Xanax, because they're seeking peace. Right? Show me somebody that's hooked to alcohol. You know what they're seeking for? Peace. Right? I'm a drug. I'm a former drug addict. I smoked dope. I did all that. You know what I was wanting? Peace of mind. Long as I had, long as I had that high going on, man, I had a peace of mind. You know what? Now stop right here and say this. What I'm about to say, understand this. Every addiction is linked to seeking the truth. And you know what? what you hear what I just said they're seeking? Peace. Peace is not a fleshly thing. It is a spiritual thing. You cannot commit fleshly acts to grab hold of something spiritual. you got to have the Spirit of God, which is peace. So every addiction out there is linked to seeking the truth. It is a spiritual thing. That's why. Listen, let's just use some country boy common sense for a minute. If you, could, if you could find everything you was looking for in a joint, it, all it would take would be one joint. If all it took was one, uh, if it was found in alcohol, it'd just be one drink. If it was found in adultery, it'd just be one act. If it was found in fornication, it'd be one act. If it was, y'all get what I'm saying? But why does people got to keep going back and going back and going back and going back? Because the truth of the matter is there's something down on the inside that they're sinking that cannot be connected with a fleshly act because it's a spiritual need, which shows us if you cannot satisfy the flesh, hey, when there's a spiritual need, then when you get born again, you cannot grow spiritually, live spiritually, walk in the spirit by Committing fleshly acts. Those things never change. When you're lost, you cannot find peace and happiness. It passes all understanding. You cannot find it doing fleshly things. When you're saved and born again, you can reduce the fruits of the Spirit in your life by committing fleshly acts. What I'm trying to say is your flesh will do nothing other than damn you, rob you, rule you, destroy you. And it's all because of the fall in the garden. Listen. Witchcraft, pharmaceutical, all drug addictions is connected with seeking the truth. It's a spiritual thing. Look at verse number 20. He says, hatred. Do I got to spend a lot of time giving you a definition of hatred? Let me solve it up like this. Some of y'all, whether I'm talking to you online or sitting in here, some of y'all got a problem with somebody else you go to church with. I don't like them. I hate them. According to Paul, that's an act of the flesh. It's impossible to hate and love at the same time. For the fruit of the Spirit is the first thing he mentions, love. I'm saved, I'm born again, I love the brethren, I can't stand that girl. Ain't no way I'm going to lunch with them. Ain't no, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I hear what you're saying, preacher. I understand all that, but I'm just saying you just don't know. No, there ain't no excuse. Hatred. What about this one? Variance. Now we're to get down in here because see, so far, so far, we we kind of we adultery didn't bother us, right? Now, at least two of y'all in here ain't committing it. <laughs> so far, fornication they ain't got us. Every one of you teenagers should have said amen right there. So far, you know, we, we, go, we go looking at all these other things, but now we're supposed to get down into some things that, man, it starts getting into our grit. Various. In other words, dispute, controversy, 
disagreement. You hear me? Which means disagreements is no other than a work of the flesh. Controversy is a work of the flesh. That's why we talked about Sunday morning and the theme is endeavoring to keep the spirit of unity. What destroys unity? Works of the flesh. Various, which means disputing, controversy, disagreement. How about emulations in verse 20? Emulations, contests, contentions, strife, competition, rivalry, accompanied with a desire of depressing, depressing another. Emulations. You see, this is how, as a, as a, let me start right here, as a pastor, I can determine when I'm talking to somebody and they start spewing out all their stuff and they start showing me they're full of strife and hatred and all that, I can turn right around and say, it's wrong, what's wrong is not the other people, what's wrong is you. Because according to Paul, it's a work of the flesh. Can I let you in on a secret? The only one that can work your flesh is you. Jody can come at me, this, that, and other, but how I respond ain't according to Jody. It's all on me. You hear what I'm saying? Y'all get me? So, no, that's why there's a reason the Bible says every man will give an account of who? Your own self. Your own self. Emulations. And Paul says in verse number 20, emulations. How about this one? Wrath. Wrath, which is strife, sedations. Heresies are allusions to fits of temper. You ever lose your temper? You ever start quarreling, or should I say just arguing? How about this? Stirring up rebellion against established authority. I should have preached this on Sunday morning. You know them people that like to say slick things just to plant a little seed to stir up a thought in somebody's mind against authority that's in the church? It's a work of the flesh. That's why I preach so hard against that mess right there. So, I, you know, the best, way, the best way to understand when a snake rises his head up is you know what a snake is. That person starts planting these things that's going against authority. Paul says that is a work of the flesh. Now, if you've been in church any length of time, you say things like that don't happen in church. Oh, yeah, it happens in church. Everybody that goes to church don't love Jesus. Everybody that goes to church ain't going to heaven. Everybody goes to church, don't want to see people walk the aisle, get saved and born again. Families grow stronger spiritually and have the blessings of God upon their life. Everybody don't go to church for like that. Some people go to church for power. Some people go to church for position. Some people go to church because they can, they can uh, have their swag of power down at the church house because they can't do it out there in the world. You understand what I'm saying? So you know what they do? They begin to stir up things. They begin to say things. And Paul says that is none other than wrath than wrath, and especially stirring up rebellion against an established authority, especially at the church. You want Bible to back that up? First Timothy chapter 5, verse number 17. And following theological ways which are contrary to the revealed truth of the Bible. This is where you should get all of your theology. Let me say it again. This is where you should get all of your theology. And anything else that is written that is outside of these 66 books, you don't put no stock in it. But preacher, what about this over here? What about that over there? If God wanted you to have that as an authority in your life, there wouldn't be 66 books in the book. There would be 67 books, 68 books, 70 books, 140 books. You understand what I'm saying? But God said that, listen, child of God, when you get saved and born again, I put together a manual that no matter what you face in life, no matter what you come up against in life, you can find your answer right there in the pages of God's word and you know what you put all of your trust all of your thoughts all of your everything you got into that book right there and then when somebody else brings you something and starts trying to change your mind or stir up what Paul labels as wrath which means somebody who's following theological ways which are contrary to the revealed truth of the Bible not the revealed truth of the pastor not the revealed truth of the Baptist denomination not the revealed truth of a blog not 
not the revealed truth of some other author, not the revealed truth of Buddha, Muhammad, the Pope. Can I go on? Joseph Smith. And there's a long, long line of lists, but the revealed truth of the inspired, inerrant word of God that God breathed on man, hey, and impressed upon him. Man wrote it down. God put the 66 together to make one, put it into your hands, said, here's your roadmap to heaven. Stick with it, believe it, trust it, love it, cherish it. It'll take you all the way to heaven. Verse 21. That's why you hear me say most times, not that I'm a Baptist, but that I'm a Bible believer. There's a vast difference, vast difference between being a Baptist and a Bible believer. Why do you got Baptists on your sign out there? Because as a Baptist, they are the closest religious denomination that I have found that lines up the closest to the truths of the Bible. But even in that, they have error. That's why there's 1,047 different kinds of Baptists. Are you Southern Baptists? Are you American Baptists? Are you Free Will Baptists? Are you this Baptist? Are you that Baptist? That other kind of Baptist? I am a born again child of God, Bible believing Baptist. Why are you a Baptist? Because I believe in baptism. They don't know why I'm on that right there, but maybe somebody needs to listen and understand it. But I am a Bible believer before I'm a Baptist. You hear what I'm saying? Listen, look at verse 21. Envians, murders, drunkenness, revilings. The first three explain themselves envying. That's those of you that look over at somebody else has got something that you wish you had and you envy them. Man, I wish I had. You fill in the blank. Envying. Work of the flesh. Work of the flesh. Murders. Do we got to give you a definition of murder? Drunkenness. See that right there? Drunkenness. Do I got to give you a definition of that? It's wrong to drink. Alcohol is wrong. One cup of wine is wrong. Preacher, what's wrong? One cup of wine. Proverbs tells you, you can look at that glass. There's a spirit that comes with it. It will stir itself in its own glass. And there's no way, there is no way you can drink a cup of wine and it not influence. I can drink all the water all day long and keep my sound mind. And that is enough right there. And Paul comes back in and says, drunkenness, revilence, carousing with one another. Carousing with one another. And he goes on to say, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. Here's a clear reference to Paul's past preaching of chapter 4, back over in chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Why Paul had to preach it again? Why am I preaching it? It's because it's what we deal with every day. If you've been saved any length of time, you've had strife. If you've been saved any length of time, you've coveted. If you've, had, if you've been saved any length of time, you've bucked authority. Right? I ain't talking about just bucking pastoral authority. I'm talking about bucking authority. He's told you to do one thing, and you did the opposite. That's bucking authority. You hear what I'm saying? You know, it can be right here and wrong there. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, on the surface, it looks like you got it all together. But that right there be all messed up because there's no way that all these workers of the flesh and envy and strife and anger and malice and bitterness and all that can be all mangled up because all that is inwardly things. And it'd be right here. Does that make sense? Look, Paul's saying, look, I had to keep preaching on this because that's why. That's our biggest battle, man. Look at me. I don't battle alcohol. I tell you what I used to be and what I did before because that's what God, and that was one of the big things in my life. I don't battle drugs. You hear me? I don't battle what music to listen to. I don't battle what Bible to use. I don't battle what church to go to. Those things, that's not my battles. But you know what my biggest battle is, Miss Jane? Is that dude I look at in the mirror every day of my life. This, what you're looking at, that's my biggest battle. We all battle the flesh. And we struggle with the flesh. And Paul said, I've given you this checklist because, listen, it is easy to get influenced and caught up living in the flesh. And be justified because you got some works. 
you go to church. You half read your Bible. You half pray. You understand what I'm saying? So you can justify here based off these things. And Paul was saying, look, but if these things is in your life, here's your checklist. It ain't right. And Paul don't want us living that way. Because it's impossible to have a victorious Christian life with a life full of fleshly living. So the only way to have a victorious life, the only way not have to struggle, well, you know, with do I have sex or do I don't have sex? Do I listen to this music? Do I not listen to this music? Do I read my Bible or not read my Bible? Do I go to church? You know, there's Christians at home right now tonight that struggle tonight. Should I go to Bible study or not go to Bible study? I tell you how to start eliminating these acts of the flesh in these battles that we have when you yield yourself to the Spirit of God, put the flesh, hey, on the cross of Calvary and say, what would God want me? to do and then you know what when you ask God what would you want me to do well he wouldn't want you sitting at home watching Fox News at 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night he'd want you at the house of God he would y'all get what I'm saying look at the remainder of that verse he says that they which do such things you see that the kingdom of God in these verses is not the kingdom of God mentioned in Romans chapter 14, verse number 17. For the one in Romans is a spiritual kingdom into which a man is born in this age, John chapter number 3. The kingdom of God here is an inheritance. You can get tripped up if you don't rightly divide the scriptures. You can almost take these verses and say this. If you're committing these acts, then you've lost your salvation because that no man shall inherit the kingdom of God. But in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 21, the kingdom of God is not dealing with the salvation of a soul. It is dealing with an inheritance that you can have or lose. You hear what I'm saying? Because the Bible says it's appointed a man wants to die after this, the what? Judgment. In the life that you live since the day you got saved to the day you die or the day of the rapture, you're going to be put on trial for your works. And everything that you've done, has it been for the glory of God through the Spirit of the Lord? Or has that been done fleshly? Everything done fleshly is going to be burned up. There is an inheritance that you can inherit. There's also one that you can lose. He says, which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom is earned by service. Write this down. Ephesians 5, verse 5. By service. In other words, these people, the only thing they do is go to church. They're going to have a rude, awakening, heartbreaking time whenever they get to see Jesus face to face. When all they have, when all they have, what would you do for the Lord? I went to church. Look at me. You coming to church is not for him. It's for you. It's for you. Listen, he don't need no teaching or preaching on Galatians chapter number 5. He wrote it. He is the author. He don't need that. Us being here, this ain't for him. It's an act of obedience. It pleases him. Don't get me wrong. But this is for us. Why? This ain't a place of service. This is a place of worship. Right? We come in here to worship. There's a difference between worship and service. We serve out there. You hear what I'm saying? Now, I know we got people, uh, you know, I preach. We got door holders. We got musicians. We got, I know all that. And all of them are small acts of service. But if that's all you're doing, you're missing out. Y'all get me? Am I making myself understandable? Listen, the kingdom is earned, is earned by service. Ephesians 5, verse 5, Colossians 3, 24. It is not the free gift by the grace of God which placed the believer into the kingdom. Colossians 1, 13. In other words, you get saved, glory to God, say amen right there. But there's something else that goes along with salvation. There's an inheritance that you can have. But just because you're saved don't mean he's just going to automatically give you that inheritance. The kingdom of God, as the one in Acts 1, has to do with the appearance of the kingdom when Christ returns. The kingdom of God. Listen, God's going to come back. We're going to go here. But we're only going to be in heaven for seven years. While tribulation is here. When the rapture takes place, we're going to heaven. During that seven years, we're going to make a stop at the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to leave the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? 
We're going to leave the marriage supper of the Lamb at the end of that seven years during tribulation down here, three and a half years peace, three and a half years pure hell on earth. But we're up there in heaven. Sometime we're going to be enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're going to watch the Savior, Jesus. He's going to get up from the table. He's going to go out. He's going to take us with us. And we're going to mount up on a horse. All this is in Revelation. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to come back. And you know what? He ain't coming back to South Carolina. He ain't coming back to North Carolina. He's going back to that little strip of land they're all fighting over right now. And over on top of that, there's a gold dome over there. You know, that the Muslims control. They always ain't going to control it. The dome's going to be knocked over. He's going to set up his throne over there. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron for a thousand years. What we know is millennial reign. And you know that you have the possibility of reigning too. You see, the Bible says we'll rule and reign with him, and we shout and holler about it. We're going to come back, we're going to rule and reign with him. But you know there's going to be a lot of people that ain't going to be reigning. They'll be with them, but they ain't going to be ruling and reigning. Why? Because they've allowed their flesh right now, and they did not inherit the kingdom of God, which is a literal, visible kingdom. Y'all with me? I hope I ain't confused you too much. So here's the nugget for tonight. You're saved by grace through faith, but you will not reign on earth with Christ, Revelation 5.10, unless you suffer with him, Romans 8.17. In other words, he's got a matter more than popularity. He's got a matter more than power. He's got a matter more than prestige. He's got a matter more than somebody knowing your name. He's got a matter more than pleasing your wife or your husband. He's got a matter more than pleasing your children. He's got to matter more than anything else. He's got to be number one in your life. Preacher, you mean I ain't supposed to love my wife? I never said that. Preacher, you mean I ain't supposed to love my children? I never said that. Because if you love him with all of your might, all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, you'll love your wife or your spouse, I should say, right. If you're loving him with everything you got, you'll love your children, right. Teenagers, if you're loving him with everything you got, you won't have that distant, rebellious spirit between you and your parents. You'll be able to get along. Somebody say amen right there. You see, all that is none other than evidence. I don't know what's going on with my child. They're this, they're that, they're full of rebellion. They won't listen to me. This, that. No, I tell you what's going on. It is 100% works of the flesh. There's something wrong internally. And the only way to fix that internally, it's not giving them a new PlayStation. It's not giving them a new phone. It's not taking them on a vacation. It's to bust their butt, give them Jesus, stay on the straight and narrow, and make sure that you got to be not their best friend, but be the one that's going to lead them to Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. You're saved by grace through faith. Number two, you can be denied this inheritance. Here's your verse, 2 Timothy 2.12. You can be denied this inheritance, although you can't be denied salvation. So you won't miss out on heaven, but you can miss out on the inheritance. 2 Timothy 2.13. Once you are in Christ, you're always in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 through 9. In other words, your service for Christ, Colossians 3.24, then determines your earthly rewards in the millennium. I didn't make this up. Luke 19.17. My service now will determine my earthly rewards in the millennium. So this life you're living does matter. And there's too many Christians that's living to please the flesh, pacifying the flesh, and thinking, you know what, you know, I'm getting by, but we're going to have a rude awakening whenever we come back. And we think we're going to come back and we're going to rule and reign this, that, and the other. But if we ain't been working now, working now, you're saved by faith and grace. But you inherit by your works. And your works is determined by the motive of your heart. And if the motive of the heart is fleshly, it ain't going to last. But if it's spiritually because of your love towards Christ. I mean, think about this. Think about this. Why would anybody, I'm, I'm, this is a serious question. Why would anybody, from myself all the way down, sign up to live a life that there is always a struggle between what you want and what somebody else wants for you? You hear what I'm saying? Because before salvation, it was all about what you wanted. After salvation, it's about what he wants for you. And there's a struggle. There's a struggle. 
I don't know about you, but a lot of people lay down in defeat because of that struggle. I kind of like to use it as fuel for the fire. If I'm struggling to please him, it must be because there's somebody that dwells within me. In other words, a sense of spiritual security. Because, look, Justin, you have to admit, if you could quit, you've already quit. Mike, you know there's no way you'd be sitting where you're at. After all you've been through, you'd done quit. The vote ain't no way. There's no way you'd be sitting where you're sitting at right now. If it weren't for greater is he within. And Paul was saying this, listen, the only way you're going to make it is going to be through the fruits of the Spirit, not by works of the flesh. Your service for Christ will determine your earthly rewards as millennium. As Esau, Hebrews 12, 16, you can lose this inheritance. Hebrews 12, 17, for it is condoned on works. Why? Which is why the life that you live after salvation is so important. There is always a cost. Listen to me and I'm done. There is always a cost to fleshly, self-centered living. Saved or lost, there's always a cost to be self-centered, live for self, don't worry about nobody else, don't care about nobody else, I'm going to take care of me and mine, and I'm going to go and do what I want to do, live like I want to live, it ain't nobody going to tell me no different, it will cost you, saved or lost. Personally, I think the saved person is going to pay a higher penalty, personally. Because, listen to me, you do know, and I'm done, I promise you, you do know that there's something worse than the rapture taking place and this world ending and you not know Jesus and going to hell. You know what's worse than that? Is to be saved by faith have an opportunity to live a life pleasing to him and live it and waste it in righteous living and make it back home to the Father with nothing but rags and stench of this world of the life that you've lived. Y'all get what I'm saying? I don't want to be at the judgment seat of Christ and look at the nail-scarred hands of Christ who gave his life for me and all I got to offer him is a life of fleshly living. Y'all get what I'm saying? I don't know about you. That's going to be a greater heartache because, you see, a lost man, a lost man is doing what comes natural to a lost man. He knows no different. But if you're saved, you know different. You have a choice. A lost man has no choice. A saved man does. A lost man can't put his self on the cross. A lost man can't make a decision to, have, uh, to go the way of the Lord and yield himself to the Spirit of God and, and have the fruits of the Spirit. A lost man can't do none of that. But a saved man can. And sad, sad day. We all talk about going to heaven, you know, and I hate to be the one that puts the needle in the balloon and busts everybody's joy. But there's a stop we're going to make, Miss Rhonda, between here and heaven. Before we ever walk on the pearly streets, and walk through the, the gates of pearl or the uh, golden streets, y'all don't understand, what, before we ever experience the throne room of God, you know what you're going to do? You're going to stand before him at the judgment seat and give an account. That's why it's important as children of God, we endeavor to keep the spirit of unity. Endeavor to keep that spirit of unity between here and there. Then we can have, we got it here, then we can work on here. So when we get there, we can stand there, you know what, and not be knee deep in ashes, but at least have something, at least have something to give back. You ever heard this saying, you can't take nothing to heaven with you? That's a lie. That's a lie. You can't take something to heaven with you. A God-honoring, Christ-centered living life you can take it from here to there and he'll be pleased with it you ever heard these words well done thou good 
and faithful servant. If there's no service, you can be no servant. And we'll never hear those words. We're not going to hear those words because we got saved. We're not going to hear those words because we're Baptists. We're going to hear those words because we crucified our flesh, sacrificed our life, gave it to Jesus, and we lived our life the best of uh, our ability to fulfill the commission and the plan he has for our life. Everybody's got different plans, no doubt. Everybody ain't called to preach. Everybody ain't called to be a preacher's wife. Everybody ain't called to be a preschool teacher. Everybody ain't called to be a deacon. Everybody can't play a musician. But one thing we have all been called to do, and that is to live a life pleasing to him in whatever path he takes you on. Does that make sense? And Paul said, here's your checklist. Ching. Now, if these things is found in your life, it's hindering you. Get rid of them. How do I get rid of these things? For if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive us and what? Cleanse us. Cleanse us. Thank God that we just don't get forgiven. We get cleansed. Father, we love you tonight, God. And we are grateful and thankful for the word of God. God, we're thankful, Lord, for the teaching of the things that you have for us, God. God, you have set us up, Lord, to be the most successful, victorious child of God that we could possibly be. It's just a matter of us yielding to what you'd have for us. So help us all as children of God to go out here and live the life that you've blessed us with, you've gifted us with. But help us, Lord, to give it back to you and to live a life that's going to be pleasing to you. That in that day to come, God, whenever that day may be, Lord, we may inherit that kingdom that you are so so uh, uh, lovingly provided for us or will provide for us, God. And happy day, happy day when we can rule and reign with our bloodstained Redeemer. Go with us now. Bless this offering. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Don't forget, Brother Ryan, to be at the side door. If you ain't signed up, $50 a month between now and uh, July, or you can pay a one-time $300, however you want to do it. Uh, put your name on there, and Trevor will get back with you. Uh, all this will go towards our teenagers uh, going to arise in July. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Don't forget Sunday morning, 930 prayer, uh, 10, uh, 10 o'clock Sunday school. Uh, I invite you, if you're not plugged in somewhere at Sunday school, you're missing out on a lot uh, that helps us in our everyday uh, uh, spiritual life to inherit that kingdom. And uh, so I love to invite you to come and uh, be in our Sunday school class. Uh, there's somewhere for every age. Amen. Uh, I'll pray again, and then uh, you can exit out the side door. And remember, everything given tonight goes 100% to the Jubilee coming up in the fall. Father, may the grace of God go with us in Jesus' name. God loves you. We love you. And we'll see you Sunday morning.